Hey, good morning to those of you out there on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you here on the East Coast with me. It's a beautiful day. In today's training, I want to cover down on getting federal buyers to call you. Uh, a lot of us sometimes don't track this, right? We, we pay attention to who are we reaching out to? Are we going to a vendor outreach session? Are we picking up the phone and calling this customer, et cetera? Like I have a workshop where uh, the, the output is outreach. It's reaching into the agency. But that's just one part of sales is outbound, right? Where you're reaching out. There's also this inbound idea, this idea of getting the buyer to call you, to get teammates to call you. And I put in here on my first bullet that there's over 200,000 buyers. And this is something really important to understand. When I say a buyer, that number is nowhere near the real number. Um, in DOD alone, the Department of Defense, they have 185,000 acquisition personnel, right? Acquisition personnel are only one part of the buying. They're clearly the signature authority, right? But they're just one part. Then you have the entire rest of the buying team, which includes the program office. And so you could easily double this number. But if you think about 185,000 just in DOD, imagine what it would be when you add in the VA, Department of Homeland Security, HHS, and these 100 other plus agencies that are out there. You're looking at a half a million buyers easily. And the same thing with teammates and in industry. There's 300,000 firms out there. But if all you did was looked at the um, firms that are doing business with DOD, just using that again, there's 15, 20,000 at any given point that have prime contracts, uh, according to DOD and some of the stats. But if you just begin to look at that and you figure three, four or five per, per company, because that adds in the larges, right? Some larges have, you know, a thousand people who are buyers for what they're doing. When you look at this sheer volume of buyers and teammates, et cetera, you're not gonna be able to reach out to them. You're never gonna be able to get out there. You'll only reach a small fraction. I put here less than 1%, but I think it'd be fair to say less than 1% of 1% is who you'd be able to do proactive outreach, right? Active marketing, active sales where you're going out there. And so what do you do about the other 99%? Well, that's what I wanna talk about today, right? I want you to follow a plan that begins to drive some of those buyers to you when they want to find a company like yours. Not when you wanna go knocking on a door because you wanna get into this agency or you wanna pursue this opportunity. That's perfect, but that's active sales, active marketing. What about when you can sit there and just receive a call and somebody says, hey, can you come talk about your expertise? Hey, can you come bid on our, um, or, or respond to a source of thought or bid on an opportunity we have? right? You want to be able to be fielding those inbound requests from teammates and buyers for you to come work with them. And that's what we're going to cover in today's training uh, as it relates to how to get federal buyers to call you and how to get teammates to call you. So I want to uh, just start with why you should be known for one thing, right? The way you get buyers to call you is for them to know what you do. And so that's uh, being known for one thing. The second thing is I want to talk about how do you get known for one thing? So how do you be a SME where the buyers are looking? And then the third thing I'm going to wrap up with is talking about this whole idea of RFIs and sources sought, um, how if you maximize their potential, those can lead to you getting a lot more inbound calls. OK, so let's drive into those trainings. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I'm the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome you to my federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner. And since 2018, I've been teaching people like you that government contracting is not a secret, it's just a process. When you follow a process A to Z, you're going to have repeatable, predictable results. And that's what I want for you. You can see here, if you're looking at my screen, that I lay out a seven-step process that I teach my customers. And it's what I use to guide all these trainings I do for you when you come join me every day at noon, right? This seven-step process, if I follow this process, if you follow this seven-step process to uh, federal revenue success, then you're going to have the success you want. You're going to have repeatable, predictable revenue going forward. And so that's why you see me drive constantly into process. Okay, let's start with um, why you should be known for one thing. I advocate this all the time is that you want to niche down. You want to niche down all the possible things you, you could sell and come all the way down, narrow it down. And I used an example in yesterday's training with Ford Motor Company. Uh, when this guy, Alan Mullaly, who turned around Ford from being in really bad shape to being in really great shape, when he came in, people would have thought Ford was niched down because they sold cars and trucks. But when he looked, it's like, well, you don't just sell cars and trucks. You sell Ford, you sell Ashton Martin and Volvo and Jaguar. He's like, you got too much. And so he niched it down to just the Ford cars, the ones we build 
uh, in Detroit, as an example. I want you to watch out for that same thing is you want to niche down um, to one type product. And the reason you want to be doing this, first reason I put here is that it makes you findable and attractive, your company findable and attractive. And what this means is if somebody types into Google, for lack of a better place, right? If somebody types into Google, a keyword that you want to be found for, then your company is found. You are findable. That's really all it means. If some, somebody types plumbing and you're a plumber, you want to be found. If somebody types cybersecurity, you want to be found. And so you, you want to make sure that you're findable. And the more things you say you sell, the harder it is to be findable because you just get blended with everybody else. You're competing against those companies who sell just one thing. Um, the attractive part is when they find you and they start looking at your marketing material, whether it's your website or LinkedIn, et cetera, when they look at your marketing material, your company is attractive to them because you, you are matching their search intent. If I have somebody who's looking for um, cybersecurity and they come in and see, hey, this company does cybersecurity, but they also do this, 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 and this. It's like, well, are you really focused on cybersecurity or did you just throw that keyword in because that's what everybody wants these days? What they're looking for is a cybersecurity firm. They're not looking for an everything firm. When you go to the bagel shop, are you one of those people who get an everything bagel or do you get cinnamon raisin? Okay, so the second uh, reason I put here on why you should be known for one thing, that one uh, thing that you sell, we call a core competency, right? You want to be memorable. You want it to stick in your head. There's um, companies out there like uh, Bain Group, I've talked about forever, Bain Group, Microsoft 365, Bain Group, SharePoint is part of Microsoft 365. I have them in my mind. I don't know if I've talked to them in a couple of months, but they will always be in my mind. And it's the same thing for uh, you. You want to be memorable to people like me, to the others in our community, to federal buyers, to people you meet at a vendor outreach session or a conference or wherever you're at. You want to be memorable. And I don't mean, um, hey, look how great that graphic is or something. I mean, easy for them to remember you is what I mean by memorable. So I go, this company does this thing. Perfect. Now I remember who you are. Now you are memorable. And then the last reason I put here just on the top on why you should be known for one thing is that it focuses your response efforts. When you are known for one thing and when you know yourself and your company for one thing, all of your effort is focused. When you look for opportunities to respond to a RFI or sources sought or an RFQ, a quote or a a request for proposal, an RFP, when you look for those type of opportunities, because you were uh, known for one thing, not just to the external folks, but to yourself, when you're known, you're able to pick the opportunities that you're most likely able to contribute a really good response, whether it's a winning response to a proposal or a response that generates a, um, attraction to the, to the federal buyer, to your company. Wow, this company is writing a really good response. I'm attracted to learn more from this subject matter expert firm, right? So it focuses your response effort, which is always good. I wanted to share with you just uh, four quick tips on, or four quick steps on how a buyer looks for you. Teammates are kind of like this, but uh, at the moment, let's just stick with a federal buyer. When they go look for your company, in a company like yours, not your company, when they go look for a company like yours and they say, I have this need, I need a company that can fill it. The first place they tend to look, right? And I'm not here to debate the exact way because every agency is different. But basically what I'm saying is the exact process. <laughs> I like how I said that. Basically, it's the exact process. Um, anyways, I enjoyed that. It's Thanksgiving weekend. All right, so uh, the first thing they do is look at incumbents. If I have a need, I'm gonna look internally and go, can one of my incumbent firms handle it? How about a recent incumbent who was, you know, a contract expired in the last year, maybe even two years. I'm looking at the incumbents because if I trusted them before, then I'm gonna trust them again to at least have a conversation, right? So that's one way. The second way is um, if they don't find what they're looking for or if they want to expand their reach into industry, they look for people who have responded to, to RFPs or to RFIs or to sources sought. When you respond, right, they're tracking on that. Let's just say they put you on a list and they say, hey, this, this company responded to us last time. When you respond, right, you're on their radar as a company who's willing to participate in the market research activity or the market research phase of the acquisition lifecycle. This is really important to them because part of their reason for reaching out to you is they want to get your input or your response back to whatever they're trying to do. And the fact that you responded before is a good sign to them that you're going to respond this time. So previous responders is the next one. And then the third one, the, you know, as they're moving forward, right? If they can't find what they need in the incumbents, 
in the previous responders to RFPs or RFIs, then they look out to the supplier portals. They have their own internal list sometimes, like somebody just keeps a spreadsheet. Uh, I was looking at an agency the other day, I think it was DIA actually, where they say, just send us an email if you're interested and we'll add you to our internal list. There's other agencies that have a little more formal one, like HHS has a very formal small business directory uh, where suppliers register in there. And then the overall government's small business supplier portal or registration tool is SAM and DSBS. This makes up your small business profile. So they'll go into the dynamic small business search tool, DSBS. This is where they find hundreds of thousands of small businesses. And they're looking in there to say, can I find a few firms, five, 10, 20 firms that do what I'm looking for to come out? So an example is if they're looking for a product called Nintex, which is a Microsoft SharePoint third-party add-in tool. If they're looking for something like that, they might go into DSBS, type that, and bring back the firms that say they do that. And if they've got a decent amount, they might reach out to them before they do anything else. And then the formal and fourth way is formal market research. When they submit a source of sought out through SAM or whatever, out to industry, they're submitting an RFI or, or source of sought saying, hey, we'd like to talk with industry, get back hold of us. But um, so I don't want to go too far into those, but these are the ways they go looking for you. And it's important that as you move forward, that you're tracking on that. The one thing that is not in here, though, is how do buyers find you um, when they're when they're in what I call informal market research? They're just noodling around an idea saying we want to go this direction. We're trying to go this direction. Let's think more about artificial intelligence or we're trying to figure out how can we use elevators without power and they just float, whatever. Right. <laughs> when they want to go out. Well, these federal buyers are no different than you. They go out to the Internet and they look right. They're seeing what's out there. And that's what I want to talk to you about next. Um, uh, darn, I got animation on this slide. I didn't mean to have it. Uh, let me just click through really quick because I don't need animation today. OK, I think that's all my slides or bullets. So here I want to talk to you in this slide about um, how to be the subject matter expert where buyers are looking. So where should you be demonstrating that you're a subject matter expert? We like to call it supreme domain authority, right? What are you doing to demonstrate that you are a supreme domain authority on your core competency, on your area of expertise? And so uh, the first place that they'll go looking is DSBS and the supplier portal. A minute ago, I mentioned it just as a supplier portal, but I really want you to understand how that tool, how valuable that tool is. Uh, over here on the right-hand side, you see a funnel I have, and I have a whole big training just on how buyers use DSBS to find you. But as you can see, the top funnel section says all small businesses. So when they look in DSBS, they're seeing 300,000 small businesses. And then um, they type in a keyword, right? Rarely does anybody just use a NAICS code because it the responses are just too many. And so they type in a keyword, like let's say plumbing. And then the very next thing, right? The keyword makes you findable and you come up on a roster. The very next thing is this capability narrative. And there are two fields that are 1000 characters each. So let's say 200 to 500 words that you can write that tell the story about your company that make your company attractive to that person who is searching. So your keywords, um, get them to find your profile. And then this narrative is where you're being attractive. You're matching the search intent. If I'm looking for a plumber, I'm looking for a narrative that says we've done big projects and small projects around plumbing. What I'm not looking for is plumbing, electrical, painting, flooring. Uh, we also do elevators and all this other stuff. Then I'm like, well, I'm looking for an expert. I really want the best plumber. I don't want leaky pipes, right? Thanks a lot. I'm moving on to the next one. And so these narratives that are in there, there's two fields and you can go watch my training on the DSBS um, on your DSBS profile, how to rock that. But those narratives are the way to begin to demonstrate your subject matter expertise or expert by the words you put in and the and the way you phrase your sentence, your sentences answering, what do you do? And also where you drop a little bit of your experience. You're saying, hey, we've been paid for this work. So that's the first place that you want to be. And I want to make sure you're there before you ever go somewhere else, because this is where 80% of the buyers will go. The next one is LinkedIn. If you really are trying to demonstrate that you're a subject matter expert, you need to be out, out there. And this is called social selling. Social selling isn't just about you finding somebody you want to talk to and following them and engaging. Yes, that's part of it. But the part I want to talk about today is how do they do the same thing to you? How do the people who might want to reach you, how do the people you want to attract to your profile and to your company's profile, 
How do you attract them? And on LinkedIn, this is social selling. You're putting out content that your buyers might want. Um, I see people do this every single day where they put out content that is completely unrelated to what they do. And at some point, you just turn off the people you want to attract because they're like, that, I'm going to go over here. These people are always talking about this topic that I want to learn about or buy or whatever, right? And so you want to make sure when you're on LinkedIn, and we'll come up more about this in a second on creating content, but on LinkedIn, you want to be really focused around that one thing, that core competency. So LinkedIn, you're, most of you are here right now on LinkedIn. If you're on another social media platform, just come over and connect with me and start getting engaged on LinkedIn. But you want to use LinkedIn out there as a way to um, reach buyers. It's the only social media platform that the buyers are on doing research and having discussions about the topics of the day, whether it's um, artificial intelligence and cybersecurity or digital transformation, et cetera. Um, it's in there. The, so the two main places I want you to be thinking about um, that you're covering down, you don't need to cover down on a lot of places, but one is LinkedIn and the other is your website. And generally the content you create for those are interchangeable. But what you're trying to do is to be discovered. So some people might look for you in LinkedIn. Some people might go to Google and find you. No one usually is going to go right to your website. And the reason I say that is because if they are, they're no longer looking for a company like yours. They're looking for your company. That means they already found you somewhere else, DSBS, et cetera. And you attracted them to want to come to your website. What I mean about LinkedIn and your website is for that to help you be findable and attractive enough that they want to research your company more. So here's some uh, ideas for what you can do on LinkedIn and on your website. The first one is just blogs and articles, right? Uh, on a website, it's called a blog. And on, a, on LinkedIn, it's called an article. And these don't have to be huge. You can change it around. But if you're an expert at something, you should be able to share that content out there in a way that makes it easy for people to understand. So the last company I was dealing with was SharePoint. And, um, and all I did was LinkedIn content around SharePoint. And I was, I was, I was trying to attract uh, candidates and buyers. And so when I would share content, I would share a lot of how-to tips. And so if I did an article or a blog, I would say, hey, how to build a calendar that integrates with another calendar offline or something, right? And then I'd lay out the steps. It was very fast for me. I have a whiteboard behind me, right? That's not a, a, a BR or that's not an image on my, my um, uh, LinkedIn stream here or something. That's my actual whiteboard. I go to the whiteboard many times a day. And so if you're an expert, and you're writing blogs to what your expertise is, then you'll be able to come up with these, this kind of content. And in the beginning, write it once a week. But if you write to what you're good at, whether it's elevator management, whether it's painting, right? Think about painting, even if you just put it out there. Is there a difference between um, how we used to paint uh, military installation buildings to how we do it to now? You know, we used to use lead, now we don't use lead. We, do we use oil-based or water-based? I don't know anything about paint. Right. But, but, you know, is are there tips for how to protect your floors on a painting job or things like that? So many of us are afraid to share content like that tips for success because we're worried about our competitors taking it. Let me tell you, your competitors will take it, but your competitors also know about it. And hardly any of your competitors are going to come. But who cares if you can land a million dollar or ten million dollar deal because somebody is watching you and your company drop content out? then they're going to sit there and value you. They're going to see you as a subject matter expert. They're going to keep coming back to you. Don't let the, um, you know, the possibility of somebody doing something wrong to you stop you from doing all these right things to the buyers that you want to reach. Um, and the, the other thing to keep in mind is there's pretty much nothing you know that your competitors don't know. If you're both painters, if you're both cybersecurity firms, we're all pretty much in the same industry. So now it's a matter of just be really free with your information to your buyers and that'll attract them. The next one going with that whole same theme is mini webinars. Um, I was talking with somebody the other day and they were saying that they were planning on webinars and looking at it. I'm like, stop planning. Just do it. Just say, I'm doing a webinar tomorrow and come in. Like this webinar, the reason I can deliver, and this is basically these live trainings or webinars, right? I do a 30 minute webinar. I plan it. I, I mean, I lay out the title a, a few days in advance just so I can let you know it's coming. But the slides, I don't build them until an hour or two before the uh, the live. And I do it really fast. It's 30 minutes of my time because I know what I'm going to talk about. I only talk about what I know. I don't. You don't ever see me talking about pricing, for example. That's John Barker and other people, right? They know pricing. 
I don't really know pricing. I mean, I played pricing when my, in my last company, but they're the experts on that. I'm the expert on this. What are you the expert on? If you're an expert on a particular thing, then creating a mini webinar is pretty straightforward. And you don't even have to do slides. Like you can do slides or you can just do video talking like I like to do, or you can turn your face off and just have slides, right? But these mini webinars will allow people to begin to hear your company's expertise through your voice, through your content. And you can use the same ideas, right? How to uh, updates about the products or services that are out there. And the last thing is LinkedIn posts and engagements. And so um, if you're not overly familiar with LinkedIn, right, right now I'm doing a live video stream. This is going out on LinkedIn and it's going out on YouTube, Twitter and Facebook. And the only reason it's going out on <laughs> Twitter and Facebook is because it's automatic. Um, but I, I'm in LinkedIn using their live functionality. This is one thing that's great. But you can also sit there and do the articles, like I mentioned, which, you know, blogs for your website. Um, you can take those mini webinars and do them in the lives, or you can just record them and then post them as a video on LinkedIn as a post. You can also do take these longer blogs and break it down into a short summary. Like if you say, here's 10 steps to do something, and in those 10 steps, you explain the why, the what, and the whatever in them, you have a longer article, right? That's an article. Well, on your post, you could just take the title of each one of those 10 steps and say, if you'd like to learn more, go to my article, right? So there's this way to create content out there that enables you to start teaching people. And when you start doing this on a regular basis, let's say you do this once a week. I do this every day. But if you do this once a week, by the end of a year, you will have 52 pieces of content that say, we're the experts. And if you talk in a way and you talk about things that are uh, what we call evergreen, that'll last several years, the information is valuable, right? You're not, you know, I never talk about something that's going to go away in a, in a month or two. It's like, why bother? Only, really only yesterday and today because it's Thanksgiving. I'm like, ah, I'm talking about the word Thanksgiving or something, but the content that I'm giving you will last for years. It's not going to change. Nothing's going to change about it in the next couple of years. Federal buyers are still going to find you the exact same way in a couple of years. Might be some more tools, but they'll definitely do it this way. You can do the same thing. When you share content out there on LinkedIn as a post, as an article, et cetera, then um, it's going to be there to be discovered, making you findable and then attractive to the buyer because they like what you're saying. It matches their need. Okay, so let's wrap up with um, RFIs. So if you're not familiar with uh, the way market research is done within the federal government, before they the government puts out a request for proposal or a request for quote to try to get a bid or a proposal from us, they submit a, uh, a source of sought notice or RFI notice, not always, but for the most part, they put these things out, right? This is how they engage industry. Uh, and so I'm not talking about the timing, I'm talking about the value of these two tools. So a request for information done correctly is then trying to engage us, engage you in a dialogue around their particular needs. So if we're talking about um, elevators, we might be talking about the braking systems and an RFI they might want to talk about the, the three different types of elevators that are out there and which ones should they be thinking about in a seven store building, story building compared to 50 story building or something like that. So RFI is talking about the requirements. Sources sought is really just looking, saying, hey, any small businesses out there who can do this work? A lot of other things that go into it. But um, those things, you should know about this. And I have a lot of training that you can go watch and it digs into it. But the reason I'm saying this is you want to respond to these. You want to be responding to sources sought at your target agency. And the key is to make sure you're responding only to the one thing. Remember, I said the value of having a one thing is that the opportunities you go after, the market research participation that you do will all be around opportunities that are focused in your space. So uh, really quickly, I just want to talk about what happens when you submit an RFI or a source of sought, right? And I'm talking about from a sales perspective, not from an acquisition perspective. But when you send an RFI in, couple of basic things happen that I want you to be aware of. One, they receive it and log it, right? Uh, they need to track this activity for themselves and for whoever they report to. The second thing is they disseminate it. And we'll talk about that in the next bullet. They disseminate it to the people who should be looking at it. And the third thing is they store it, right? They store it somewhere in a network drive or wherever. However they do it, every agency is different. Probably every contracting officer is different, right? But they store it somewhere. They don't just get it and throw it away. So they store it and it's there available. The reason this is important is because um, like I mentioned uh, in an earlier slide, 
when they're looking for somebody the next time, if you responded to this RFI or this source is sought, the next time they're looking for somebody, you are now on their list because they appreciate the fact that you participated in their market research activity. So the people who look at this, there's uh, several people, but the two I really want to cover down on are the contracting officers and the program office uh, personnel, the program manager, right? So the contracting officer is looking for sources sought. So in the future, if they're looking for people who are a uh, woman owned small business in a particular space, they're tracking some of that data in their own reporting tools and they're able to pull you up faster. They're able to see your writing responses that are dry, that are not being rejected by the program office. And let's go to the program office really quick. When the program office gets your response to a source of sought or an RFI, that program uh, officer, that program manager, one of the first things they're gonna do is communicate back to the KO, was this worth my time reading or was it not, right? In whatever words they use, but basically they go, was this crap or not? And if it's good, now you're on the program manager's uh, mind, but you're also on the KO manager's mind from a technical perspective. You know, I love the fact that you responded and that you're a woman on small business. And I love the fact that the, the program office says that you are qualified in cybersecurity or elevators or whatever. Same thing with the program office. When they look at it and they like you and they like your response, you're on their radar for the future, right? Let's forget about whether you're able to do anything with this response, because today the reason I'm saying respond is so that program manager, when they have future needs, future questions, they'll come to you, or at least you'll be on their radar and they'll be like, you know what, I'm gonna go to the internet and go find that company. Remember I said, no one goes to your website and discovers it. They go to it because something you did somewhere else in your passive and active marketing has encouraged them to come to your website. Well, this is an example of it. They might sit there and say, I love this response. Let me go look at their website. And on their website, if you've got blogs and articles and stuff, now you're able to walk them down this thread or this rabbit hole of learning, which helps them see that your company is a subject matter expert, which helps companies or helps uh, federal buyers start knocking on your doors more instead of you having to knock on every door out there. Just remember, focus your responses always on your core competency. Always when you respond, you're trying to showcase your strengths. You minimize the weaknesses and you use extra space to really show how great you are. Because even if you can't win this one, you can really impress them for the next one. Here's what I want you to remember from today's training. Uh, the first thing is you need to have a plan for passive marketing. There's just too many buyers out there. Uh, you can barely reach 1%. So passive marketing will help you begin to address the 99% of federal buyers that are out there. The second thing is create content that is going to show that you're the subject matter expert. Don't keep it a secret, right? People don't buy from the best and they certainly don't buy from you if they don't know you, if they don't know you're the best. Third thing is make sure you maximize the use of market research, or excuse me, um, the RFIs and sources sought. So the market research phase of the government's acquisition cycle. Use that, get in, let them know who you are. Um, if you're getting value from this training and other training, do me a favor, become a sustaining member when you're ready. And then remember, for all of us, government contracting, it's not a secret, it's just a process. I'll see you in the next training.